When waiting on God gets wearisome, there can be such a strong temptation to want to take matters into our own hands. But this story so clearly shows us that the danger of doing so is hello and welcome back to my channel. Today's video, we are asking the question, is God telling you don't take matters into your own hands. When we are waiting on God to do something in our lives, whether that is to answer a particular prayer or to bring about justice to a situation or just to move in some way, but it's taking longer than we think it should, it can get really easy to become impatient and to try to take matters into our own hands. But all throughout scripture, we see that whenever someone takes matters into their own hands, it never produces the desired effect. In fact, oftentimes it can actually end up delaying the process or maybe even creating consequences that that person then has to deal with for years and years and years and maybe even generations to come. And so for today's video, we are going to be looking at the story of Moses to see this exact principle in play and to ask ourselves the question, is God telling you don't take matters into your own hands? And most likely he is. The specific story we're going to be looking at is the story of God preparing Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. I've been loving reading through the book of Exodus lately. It's been inspiring a lot of my videos. And so I just want to take a second to remind you that you can join me in taking the free Exodus story class by Hillsdale College, and they are the sponsor of today's video, which I'm super excited about. You guys already know that I love Hillsdale College, and such a big reason for that is because I went to a Christian college and I so value the biblical education I received there, and Hillsdale College is making that same biblical education accessible to anyone for free. Hillsdale College, if you haven't heard me talk about them before, they have free online classes. They currently have over 40 of them and they continue to come out with new ones each semester. I've mentioned before in my videos how I loved taking their class, C.S. Lewis on Christianity. They've also got classes like Ancient Christianity, the book of Genesis, one on the life of David, but they also have classes in all sorts of other subjects as well. They've got literature, history, politics, math, science, economics. It's seriously crazy the amount of classes they have and also the quality of those classes that they are offering completely for free. And like I've mentioned before, their classes aren't your typical stuffy, boring college lecture type classes. They're super entertaining and engaging because they use all of these different illustrations and images and music sometimes to really help you visualize the things that you're learning. And another thing that I really appreciate about the Hillsdale College classes is that the format is super digestible. So like the Exodus course, for example, is eight different sessions or lectures that are each around 30 minutes long. And then there's options for you to download study guides or to join discussion boards and take quizzes at the end of the classes, short little fun quizzes to help you retain that knowledge. And so it's easy to take in, easy to digest. And you can also start whenever and go at your own pace. And so you're not having to fit into a certain schedule. You're able to make it fit your schedule, which as a mom, I really appreciate that I can kind of just take these classes as I have pockets of time. Their Exodus story has been such a great supplement to my own personal reading through of the book of Exodus and I highly recommend it. So if you want to join me in taking this class for free and really just digging more into the book of Exodus and understanding its context, you can go right now to hillsdale.edu forward slash Casey to enroll. Once again, it's completely free, super easy to get started. So that's hillsdale.edu forward slash Casey hillsdale.edu forward slash Casey and a huge thank you to Hillsdale College for sponsoring this video. Before we get into the heart of the story, if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel. I make Christian faith and lifestyle content aimed at encouraging you to know God more through his word and to grow in his likeness. And I would love to have you here and then give this video a thumbs up if you find it helpful or encouraging. So getting into our story, when the book of Exodus opens, God's people, the Israelites, they are enduring slavery and unimaginable suffering. The text says that they were oppressed with heavy burdens, and it also says that Pharaoh ordered for all of the Israelite baby boys to be murdered because he did not want them to continue to multiply as a people. Now, if you know the story of Moses, you know that he was spared from being killed because his mom basically puts him in this little basket and floats him down the river. I'm pretty sure that's probably where we get the term like Moses basket for baby bassinets, but anyways, she floats him down the river and Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses. 
So Moses, by the providence of God, the hand of God, he grows up in the house of Pharaoh, but he knows who he is. He knows that he is not an Egyptian. He is a Hebrew, an Israelite. And so even though Moses is spared from the affliction that his people are enduring, he still sees the affliction and the oppression of his people. And one day he tries to take matters into his own hands. Here's what the text says, Exodus 2 verses 11 through 12. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses was presumably tired of waiting on God to act, waiting on God to bring justice and deliverance to his people, and understandably so. His people had been enduring this oppression, enduring this slavery at the hands of the Egyptians for 400 years. So it's understandable that he felt tired of waiting, but still Moses stepped ahead of God and him doing so did not produce the desired effect. Here's what happens in verses 13 through 15. When he, Moses, went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Moses had been waiting on God to bring justice to his people, to answer the prayers of his people. But when the affliction of his people became too much for Moses to bear, in a moment of impulse, he decided to take matters into his own hands and it backfired. He thought that no one had seen him kill the Egyptian. He looked this way and that to make sure nobody was watching, but somehow someone did see, they did know. And now one of his own people who he was trying to help is calling Moses out. The news gets back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh now wants to kill Moses and Moses has to flee. When waiting on God gets wearisome, there can be such a strong temptation to want to take matters into our own hands. But this story so clearly shows us that the danger of doing so is that it likely will not produce our desired result. And in fact, it will likely delay the process and maybe even bring about complications and consequences that we never would have had to deal with if we would have simply waited on the Lord. Easier said than done, I know. But when you're tempted to take matters into your own hands, I wanna share with you three reminders from scripture that we see from this story to help you wait on God instead. The first reminder is that God sees and hears and knows, and he will act in the right timing. As the Israelites are being oppressed, it seems like God is sort of just letting it happen. And for a period of time, he is, but he has a purpose in that. The text says in Exodus 1 that the more the Israelites were oppressed, the more they grew. It is actually through the oppression and through the slavery that God is building them into a great nation. Through that, he is fulfilling the promise he made hundreds of years before to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, that he would make him into a great nation. And he is fulfilling that promise in a way that nobody probably would have expected and nobody probably would have chosen which I have a whole video on, when Abraham and his wife Sarah were barren and God makes the promise to him that he is gonna make him into a great nation, I am sure that Abraham did not imagine him being made into a great nation by his descendants enduring oppression and slavery. And I'm also pretty sure that that's not how he would have chosen. That is not the method he would have chosen for his descendants being made into a great nation. Yet this was the purpose of God. And even though God was just letting their suffering happen and not stepping in, God had a purpose in that waiting. And at a specific time, at the right time, he had appointed to act. So from this point, 40 years go by after Moses then flees to Midian, flees to the wilderness. Then here's what the text says, Exodus 2, 23 through 24. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. 
Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God heard, God saw, God knew. In the next chapter in Exodus 3, when God calls Moses up to this role, to this task of leading the Israelites to freedom, God then reiterates these truths. He says to Moses, Exodus 3, 7 through 8, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Once again, God heard, God saw, God knew. God hears, God sees, God knows. Whatever you are waiting on God for, even if it feels like it has been forever, and it seems like God is just simply letting things happen without stepping in, remember this. God hears, God sees, God knows. He has a good purpose in all things, even when we can't see it, and at the appropriate time, at the right time that he has appointed, he will act. Isaiah 60, 22 says, when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. In the way, know that God has a purpose. He is preparing the situation and he is preparing you. Don't rush on ahead of him. Trust that he hears, that he sees, and that he knows, and that in the right time, he will make it happen. The second reminder is that God can take care of things so much better than you can. When Moses tried to take matters into his own hands, it resulted in people turning against him, Pharaoh wanting to kill him, and him having to flee into the wilderness. He took vengeance out against one Egyptian, but the entirety of his people remained enslaved. It literally changed nothing. Yet when God took action, the entire nation of Israel was made free. Pharaoh saw God's power and God was glorified. And so let this be a reminder that God moving is so much more fruitful than you trying to do it on your own. God's providence is so much more sufficient than your own and God's vengeance is so much more effective than your own. Romans 12, 19 says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. We need to let God take care of it because he can do it a whole lot better than you or I ever could. And the third reminder is that God redeems things even when we rush on ahead of him. Maybe you've already tried to take things into your own hands and you're now dealing with the consequences of it and feeling like you have just ruined everything and there is no hope. If that is you, please hear me when I say that God still can and will redeem all things things. Moses had to flee because he took matters into his own hands, yet God still had such a good purpose for that time. It didn't thwart God's plan. It didn't ruin everything. God used it for good. During those 40 years of obscurity in the wilderness, Moses started working as a shepherd. He met his wife. He had a son and God used that time, used that work to prepare Moses for the role that God had for him to step into. During those years, Moses learned patience. He learned trust. He learned how to depend on God and to let God take the lead. Moses had to be humbled before he could be used by God in a good way. Nothing went to waste. If you have already tried to take matters into your own hands, know that God already has a plan for how he is going to redeem that. He will bring good from it. It is not hopeless for you and you are not too far gone. Repent, turn to God, and trust him as you move forward in forgiveness and freedom, knowing that his way and his timing are best. This story is so encouraging to me. I hope that it is to you as well. And as a reminder, if you want to dig more into the Exodus story, you can join me in taking the Exodus story class by Hillsdale College completely for free at hillsdale.edu forward slash Casey. I'm gonna have that linked down in my description below. 
If you're willing to share, I would love to hear from you down in the comments. What have you been tempted to take into your own hands that God is asking you to trust him with instead? I'm gonna be sharing my answer to that question in a pinned comment. Again, I hope you found this video encouraging. If you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you in my next one. Bye.